This is CBC Here and Now. The lineups have been very, very difficult. The challenges of following all of the new rules when you're vision impaired. Just ahead, Jason Villard tells us his story. Plus, we have the latest COVID-19 updates. With so many of us staying inside our homes, the taxi industry is taking a killing during the pandemic, and some businesses are installing barriers to restore confidence. Good evening, I'm Carolyn Stokes. CBC News can reveal new details tonight on the police investigation that saw a cabinet minister lose her job. Earlier this month, the Mounties got a warrant to seize cell phones from Sherry Gambin Walsh. That led to her removal from cabinet. Well, tonight we can name the second person caught up in that RCMP probe. Here now is Rob Antle has the details. Paul Didham is a senior officer with the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, but earlier this month he found himself on the other end of a police investigation, an RCMP probe into Didham and Sherry Gambin Walsh. A judge signed a warrant for the Mounties to seize Didham's cell phones over allegations of breach of trust. Those are only allegations, and today CBC went to court to try to find out more to get search warrant documents unsealed, a request that was put on hold because of disruptions caused by the pandemic. In a decision made by phone, Judge Jacqueline Brazel said, I cannot see how I can justify scheduling a hearing of this application in light of the climate. A Crown lawyer from Nova Scotia has been brought in. Mark Harima previously handled another politically sensitive case in this province, the Brandon Phillips murder trial. The Crown and a lawyer for the province said the CBC's application should wait until normal operations resume. So did the lawyer for Gambin Walsh. But a different message from Didham. His lawyer, Jerome Kennedy, told the court that Didham wanted to have the search warrant unsealed and would consent to that happening. The matter is due back in court in late June to set a date for a hearing sometime down the road after that. Rob Antle, CBC News, St. John's. Our government will also establish a $750 million emission reduction fund. Well, the new funding pledged by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau includes money for the offshore in this province to help the oil and gas industry cut emissions. It's part of the Emission Reduction Fund, which aims to create and maintain about 10,000 jobs across Canada through pollution reduction efforts. This includes $75 million to help the offshore industry cut emissions in Newfoundland and Labrador. This fund will primarily provide repayable contributions to firms to make them more competitive, reduce waste and pollution, and most importantly, protect jobs. Well, the number of new cases of COVID-19 in this province continues to be low. Today, the province announced four new cases, all in the eastern region, bringing the total to 256. 176 people have now recovered. Now, some other provinces are now announcing plans to relax the strict public health measures in place. Here and now, Peter Cowan is with us live tonight. So, Peter, what are officials here saying about the possibility of easing some restrictions? Carolyn, don't get your hopes up. Uh, they're saying it's not going to happen anytime soon. There are discussions behind the scenes with officials trying to figure out what would that process look like? What would be the restrictions you might ease first? Because they've made it clear that this is going to be a very slow, very gradual process. It's not that they're all of a sudden just going to lift everything they have in place. Uh, so they did say that they're starting to look at, for example, uh, some health services. So uh, chiropractic, uh, massage therapist, physiotherapist. Those are the sort of things you may be able to go without in the short term, but it's now been a month and for some people that becomes an urgent need. Expect an announcement of just what they're going to do there sometime next week. But here's what we were told today about why they can't be starting to lift those restrictions just yet. We're not ready for that yet in Newfoundland and Labrador. In my estimation, that would be irresponsible, and we will not be doing anything that's irresponsible. Uh, we are nowhere near ready to discuss that. Um, we know there's a two-week lag for whatever measure we have taken in relation to COVID-19, uh, and that we are not anywhere past 
to the, the Easter weekend, which I think will show us very clearly how resilient uh, we may or may not have been. Uh, it is a question at the moment of holding the line. Okay, so a long time to go yet. Uh, so, Peter, if people are following the rules of physical distancing and hand washing, where are the new cases coming from? Yeah, it's an interesting question, just how is the virus spreading, considering how locked down the province is right now. And uh, we heard from the Chief Medical Officer of Health that it's a number of things. One, there are still people who are returning from travel. They have to isolate, but uh, sometimes they may have picked up the virus there, and that's showing up in our numbers. And even as we try and limit contact, there is still interpersonal contact happening. And Dr. Janice Fitzgerald says that's how it is spread can spread uh, from person to person and uh, as much as most people I believe have been following the rules of social distancing and doing a, a very good job uh, you know there are still some who are not able to or have not and um, so we will still see some spread of this virus uh, while it is circulating uh, in our community. The key thing they are going to be watching is how do the numbers look over the next week. That would take into account whatever may have happened over the Easter break and whether or not there was spread that occurred there. And Carolyn, it's clear that those numbers are going to help determine what the lifting of restrictions and when the, that lifting happens. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. That's here and now. It's Peter Cowan reporting live. Well, you may have noticed that the health minister appeared at the briefing today from his kitchen in Gander. Other times he's been in St. John's, which means he's been driving back and forth. Well, today he was asked about that. I would love to have hidden in my corner in the house for the last four weeks uh, and stayed put. But unfortunately, uh, we are uh, working in an environment where that is not possible. Uh, I will leave it up to others to judge whether or not my presence in Confederation building is essential. Uh, but we have finally got the technology into at least the 20th century, so I can do a lot more of my work from here. But until very recently, there has been no conceivable way that I could fulfill the responsibilities the Premier has placed on me or the expectations of the general public by sitting in my kitchen and hiding. Well, a man on the West Coast is having an especially hard time shopping for essentials and doing so safely. For most people, it's relatively easy to comply with physical distancing rules when you can see your surroundings. But what if you're blind? Troy Turner has more from Cornerbrook. Normal circumstances, Jason Billard is able to walk safely around his community. He's considered to be fully blind, but with the help of a cane, Billard can navigate freely. Seeing what's six feet in front or behind him, however, is a different story. I literally, literally could be standing there and someone could walk up two feet behind me and I would not go over there. Billard is having trouble adhering to physical distancing when buying essential items. Some stores have offered up staff to help him shop, which comes with its own share of problems. Others have refused to assist him. Now, some stores have been, you know, pretty accommodating. And, but the lineups have been very, very difficult. It's almost impossible, um, you know, to follow someone that's six feet in front of me and, you know, just to follow that person because to me, visually, they're not even seeable. I can't see them. The CNIB is encouraging the business community to be mindful of people with vision loss and the challenges they're facing. Keep an open mind when people are approaching your business. Um, and to, uh, you know, provide a service, pr be more supportive, uh, ask questions. Um, I mean, the same goes, uh, you know, if somebody, uh, for example, um, a single person walks in with using a white cane, do you go over and grab them by the arm? No, you ask them if they need help. Biller says it's important to balance his rights with others and to be considerate of other shoppers who deserve to be safe. He's contacted the Human Rights Commission and the Premier's Office for help. The Premier's Office says it's working with Billard on a solution. Troy Turner, CBC News, Cornerbrook. Well, taxis are practically at a standstill during the COVID-19 pandemic as people are staying home. Anthony is looking into that this evening. It wasn't so long ago people in the taxi business thought Snowmageddon was going to be the story of 2020. Of course, all that has changed. 
Uh, Jiffy Cab is taking some measures now. So Jay, tell me, what, what have you done here? Well, we, we've installed a uh, protective shield between the passengers and the drivers that prevents any sneezing or coughing going towards the driver and vice versa, back to the doors from the driver, back to the any passengers. It gives, you know, drivers and the passengers a little bit of a sense of uh, extra security when riding in a taxi. Uh, we started in Solemn yesterday in the cars late yesterday afternoon, put on the road first thing this morning, and all we've heard so far is uh, rave reviews. All right, and I guess the drivers too, because now you can't allow passengers next to the driver anymore. No, we're not allowing any passengers in the front seat at all. Only two uh, passengers maximum per any type of vehicle. If it's a car or a van, doesn't matter. It's a maximum of two passengers no matter what. Jiffy's a big, big cab company in St. John's. How's it changed things? We're down about anywhere between 75 and 80%, depending on the day. Like yesterday was a little bit busier because some uh, social services checks were out and you know people were getting you know out doing their grocery shopping you know and getting their necessities so it was a little bit busier not it wasn't a full-fledged busy day but for the amount of cars that we had on the road yesterday it made it seem a lot busier than what it yeah. what it was because yesterday we only had 19 cars on the road and you, you're one of the bigger your fleet has several have, hundred right no no we're, we're down now to 80 cars 80 cars yeah all right so there was a time where we thought Snow Snowmageddon was tough on you guys. It was very tough on us. You we were shut down, first time ever shut down completely. And you thought that was going to be the big hit. Yeah, we did, yeah. Right. You've also, the whole industry has also had kind of uh, been grappling with the government over the insurance issue. Yes, for sure, yeah. So how would you say, you know, in the, over the course of the, of the history of the taxis, how has the last year been? It, we have been busy, right? It, it was surprisingly very busy this winter. Uh, it would turned out to be a great winter and then all of a sudden it was like somebody turned off a light switch right and our business just went completely down downhill right. and you know which was to be expected and I'm glad glad that it, it has gone downwards for the safety of everybody in you know the province right and safety for our drivers safety for all of our customers and it's good to see that you know everybody is staying home now with respect to the compensation that's available do drivers qualify for any of that uh, yes they do well, I'm not sure if any drivers have quali had to even put in for it. So as long as they file their own income tax, they will qualify, from my understanding. So you know the virus is not really going to go away anytime soon, right? It's it seems not. like it's with us. Do you think we're going to get to a point where, you know, you've got like uh, special shields inside of taxis, people, things will get back to normal? I don't see. I don't think the the normal that we're used to is never going to be the same again. That's just just my my opinion. We're going to have to live with a different type of normal than what we're used to. Uh, this may be like this for a long time. Maximum two passengers in the car. You know, nobody sits in the front at all, right? So people are. I think people are going to are going to lives are going to change. All right, Jay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank Thanks. you, Anthony. Well, the provincial government is preparing to get the road construction season underway while at the same time maintaining the safety of workers during this pandemic. Transportation and Works Minister Steve Crocker says project tenders are being issued so contractors will be ready to hit the road when public health restrictions are lifted. This will be done safety first, but it's also important for us to provide stability for people, the thousands of people that work in the construction industry year every year and, and uh, that's very important to us to make sure that people have the opportunity this year if at all possible to secure their income and have some certainty going forward so you know uh, we've heard straight quite strongly from uh, from our contractors their their first priority is, as well is safety but you know they want to know what our plans are uh, once we're able to start lifting these restrictions well, many people in Labrador today are mourning the death of Inuk elder Jim Learning. Nunatuavut President Todd Russell issued a lengthy statement. In it, he describes Learning as a selfless man who didn't ask for permission before doing the right thing. Learning was well known for his opposition to the Muskrat Falls project and was even arrested and jailed for it and detained on Parliament Hill in Ottawa. Last year, at 80 years old, Learning ran as an independent against Perry Trimper in the district of Lake Melville. In his message today, Russell said Jim Learning believed in fighting for equality and justice and that he led by example. Well, the forecast looking pretty nice for tomorrow, but as we head into Sunday, things are about to change. Some winter weather on the way. We'll have all the details coming up.
Ashley is here now with a look at the weather forecast and I see you're outside again tonight and yet another sunny evening in St. John's. Yeah, I need to take advantage of this nice weather. Uh, it's hard being stuck inside all day. I know you all know that uh, as well. But yes, we did wake up to some snow in some areas, especially in Corner Brook. Uh, woke up to a little bit of a winter wonderland. Let's take a look at where we sat temperature wise, though, through the afternoon. That sun came out and it was a beautiful day. Plus four in Corner Brook and similar temperature in St. John's. Number of areas seeing anywhere from one to five degrees. And then still hanging on to those cold temperatures up through Labrador. Minus eight was the afternoon high for Lab City. Now heading uh, through the night tonight, it's going to be fairly quiet again. Just some scattered uh, flurries possible. Again, some onshore flurries possible along the west coast. Temperatures will dip again back into those minus single digits, minus double digits for northern portions of the big land as well as Lab West going down to the mid minus teens overnight tonight. Tomorrow, pretty much a carbon copy of today's forecast. Uh, temperatures within a couple of degrees. A little bit more windy, 30 to as much as 40 kilometers per hour. See a little bit of a wind shift uh, for eastern areas of the island. Otherwise, plenty of sunshine up through the big land and Lab City. You're going to hang on to the cloud cover and uh, hovering around the zero degree mark, but southwesterly is gusting somewhere between 30 to 50 kilometers per hour. Heading into Sunday, that's when the next weather maker moves in. Special weather statement already in effect. Temperatures will be sitting near or above zero through the day for most of the island, but that uh, still means that we're going to see some snow. Those winds will be easterly and gusty, anywhere from 70 to as much as 100 kilometers per hour expected. Nice day up through Happy Valley Goose Bay, though. You're going to see a high near 5 degrees, and it looks like plenty of sunshine. So let's time out this weather. Uh, it looks like we should start to see some snow move in Sunday morning. Uh, it will stay as snow for the majority of the island, and you'll see uh, we'll see some gusty winds, like I said. So snow and blowing snow certainly uh, an issue. Looks like the low will track southeast of the island, which means eastern areas will see a change over to rain and then staying as snow for the rest, pushing into southeastern portions of Labrador by the time early morning Monday rolls around. This is what I'm thinking snowfall wise. It is a little bit early. Pay attention to my Facebook and or Twitter this weekend. I will post an update uh, if I uh, if the thing if things change from this, but it's looking like uh, about 15 to 25 centimeters of snow is possible. Again, any shift in that track will move that. That's a fairly large area that will that potentially could see that significant snow. But it does look like some of us will have to shovel. But again, the good news is with all of this snow, uh, late April snow, it doesn't last too long. So that's certainly good news there. Wanted to share this weather photo with you, a mirror image there uh, on St. Paul's route just outside Grossmore. Thank you so much to Darcy Ellsworth for sending that in. And if you have any weather photos to share with us, send them to nlphotos at cbc.ca. Another great one. Thanks so much, Ashley. Have a great weekend. Good night.
Time to find out who's celebrating. Let's start with the anniversaries. Happy 53rd anniversary this week to Gordon and Sylvia Adams in St. John's. Happy 67th anniversary to Annie and Gilbert Bynum of Botwood. Happy 50th to Barbara and Linda Roberts from Grand Falls, Windsor. 60th anniversary greetings for Arthur and Elizabeth Symes. Happy 52nd anniversary to Carl and Betty Power in St. Bernard's. Happy 60th to Bud and Susie Rose of Hermitage. Happy 52nd anniversary to Don and Nina Bannister of Lethbridge. Eric and Jean Head of Meadows are also celebrating their 52nd anniversary. Happy 70th anniversary to Clarence and Effie Smith in Grand Falls, Windsor. Happy 60th wedding anniversary to Mary and Wavel Moulton in Lewins Cove. Happy 53rd anniversary to Neil and Marge Collett in Corner Brook. Happy 50th anniversary to Mary and Robert Clemens in Open Hall. Happy 52nd anniversary to Dorcas and Ernest Pierce in Hampton. William and Pansy Strugnall of Port Hope Simpson are celebrating 51 years of marriage. Happy 60th anniversary to Peter and Effie Parsons of Point May. Jerry and Linda Shepard are celebrating their 50th anniversary. Congratulations. Happy 59th anniversary to Philip and Eliza Bishop of Williams Harbor in Labrador. Anniversary greetings to Woodrow and Dora Hibbs of Peterview. It's their 57th. Happy 50th anniversary to Junior and Joan Kosh of Sunnyside. Maurice and Elizabeth Baker of Mount Pearl are celebrating their 55th anniversary. Now let's look at the birthdays. Happy 92nd birthday to Minnie Anstey in Deer Lake. Birthday greetings to Clara Reed of Bishop's Falls. She's turning 95. Happy 90th birthday to Bernie Kerfont of Cape St. George. Joseph Masters of Red Harbor is celebrating his 97th birthday. Happy 90th birthday to Harry O'Gay in Clarenville. Happy 91st birthday to Cherry Buffett of St. Albans. And happy 94th birthday to Cyril Pope of Mount Pearl. Another fine crowd. Congratulations once again. Well, in case you lost track of what day it is, it's Friday and there won't be any medical briefings until Monday. But officials will release the number of new cases over the weekend by email. So let's just recap the numbers now. Four new cases announced today, bringing the total to 256. 176 people have now recovered. And here's a final thought from Dr. Janice Fitzgerald. She's encouraging people to get out of the house this weekend to get some fresh air. If you are going to expose your family to something this weekend, let it be sunshine and fresh air and not COVID-19. If you are going to get out and enjoy nature this weekend, please do it safely. If you go for a hike, do it with people in your bubble. Don't congregate in trailhead parking lots. Stay at least two meters or six feet from anyone who isn't in your bubble. Of course, please remember all the principles of hiking safety that still apply in this time of COVID. I have been quite impressed while on my own treks by people respecting the principles of social di or physical distancing. While COVID-19 has profoundly changed life as we know it right now, it has also forced us to slow down, reflect, and reconnect with family members within our own bubble. It has provided us with an opportunity to spend quality time with each other learning new things and growing together. Even on days with dark clouds, I hope we can all look for these silver linings. A positive note to end on and we'll wrap things up tonight with some of your photos sent to us over the past few days. Just have a look at these. Uh, we had some photos sent in to us to mlphotos at cbc.ca. Thanks so much for spending part of your evening with us, everyone. Hope you have a great and safe weekend. We'll see you on Monday.